So uh, I want to just start today off. You know what I've noticed over the years? A lot of times we have Mother's Day and like we just dote over moms and they're awesome and we talk about how great they are. And then we have Father's Day and we like beat up dads and say, be a better dad. Kind of, you know, like that's kind of what we do at times, you know, and like subconsciously sometimes we do that. And so I'm talking about in church services. And so uh, I just I, I want to celebrate dads today. I want to start off with this uh, video as we introduce them. We don't normally have this many videos in a, in a service, but I, I've seen this a few times, like floating around Facebook and stuff like that. And it, it's awesome. Uh, and this is like a little clip of it. I don't even know what the name of the video is. Epic Dad Reflexes or something like that. So, hey, could you show that for us? This is awesome. I mean, these guys right here are another level of, um, of uh, and, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for? Y'all don't know either, do you see? So we're not alone. Are we going to play the video? Or are we? Is there, there we go. Awesome. Watch this. This is amazing. Oh, my gosh. What does that mean? Oh, dad say. That's pretty good. Donnie Point. Boom. Got him. This one is outstanding. I mean... <laughs> this right here is fantastic. Look at that swing. I wouldn't get on that swing. <gasps> this is the best. <laughs> <laughs> Right into a kiss, you can't beat that. That's good, awesome dad reflexes. There's a whole ton of them, I love them. They're great. My man was asleep on the couch, Sam, and just boom, just like that, got it? That's fantastic, you can't beat that. I love this quote, it's attributed to Mark Twain. Who knows if he actually said it, but it's great anyway. He said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But I got to be 21, and I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. <laughs> how many of you know many of us can have that testimony? That's probably why I like that quote, because I think of Jonathan's 14-year-old self I think of my 25-year-old self at times in the silliness of the things that I said, uh, and my dad at times who actually is in service today. I don't think he's been in service. I have my dad and my father-in-law here on Father's Day. I don't know when that's, if that's ever happened, so uh, that's wonderful. Both of them have moved here, so I guess that'll happen a lot now, and uh, so good to have them. Hey, we are in, if you're get, visiting with us today, if you're not, then you, you'll, just to catch up a bit, we are in a series out of the book of Ephesians. Our, 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 our theme for the year at Destiny Life is to be strengthened. And so out of that, we're talking a lot out of the Word of God. Because here's the reality. You really don't need, now thank the Lord for people's opinion and wisdom and all that, but the biggest strength that we could ever have as a believer is to really feast on the Word of God, to allow the Word of God to really bring strength to us. And of course, see, as that comes to light, as the Holy Spirit brings that to light, as teachers and preachers and people that we're with bring scriptures to life, obviously that is good, but we really uh, just trust the Word of God to really strengthen us. And so we're going through the book of Ephesians, and today we are in chapter 2. We're in chapter 2, verse number 18, and it's really appropriate verse for Father's Day, because it talks about having access to the Father. In fact, the title of the message today is You Have Been Given Access, right? Because I didn't want to title it hashtag dad life, all right? I didn't want to do that. So you have access. And as you look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 18, here's what it says. Let me read it in a couple of different translations, and then we'll give you the context of what Paul is saying here. Paul says in this letter to, to the Ephesians, he says to him, for through him, that's Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Here's how it says it in the New Living 
uh, translation. It says, now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. You might notice there in the first verse, the, the S, when it says Spirit was capitalized, the reason for that is because he's talking about the Holy Spirit. So this is really a fantastic verse to illustrate the Trinity, even in the Word of God, because you have the fullness of the Godhead represented in this verse. He says here, for through Him, Jesus we both. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jews, the Jewish people, and he's talking about Gentiles or the nations of the earth or non-Jews. He's saying both of us now have access in one spirit to the Father. Here's what it says in the Amplified Translation. The Amplified Translation, I like to read it for a verse or two because it literally does what the translation says. It amplifies. It takes a Greek word, certain words in there, or the original language, and it begins to amplify in our language what that word meant in the Greek. But when you start reading chunks of Scripture, it can get a little confusing because there's so many extra words. So it says this in the Amplified. For it is through Him that we both have a direct way of approach in one spirit to the Father. And so last week we talked about the peace of God. Right before this uh, verse here in, in uh, verse 18, verses 13 through 17 talk about us having uh, peace with God. And the reason that we that he talks about that is because as a believer, as a New Testament believer, that means that the Spirit of God lives on the inside of us. And because we know that God doesn't just give peace, he is peace. That means that when I have Christ in my life, I have peace peace. For me to say I don't have peace is not theologically correct. Now what we mean in that, I'm not trying to be a word cop, what we mean in that when we say I don't have peace is that peace is not manifesting in my life. Right? You might notice and sometimes this bothers Jonathan, don't let me put this on you. It's just me because I sometimes in my own heart can be a word cop because I think language is so valuable. When we sing about the Holy Spirit coming, which I do and it's great, Holy Spirit move. I love all that, okay, because I understand the Holy Spirit does move and manifest Himself. But how many of you know we're not literally saying, I'm talking about New Testament believers, we're not literally saying, Holy Spirit come. Why? Because He's already here. If I'm standing here and I'm saying, Sam, come, Sam, come here, and He's like, dude, I'm here, come here, Sam, right? We think it's silly because Sam's here right? Well, the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of us. So what are we actually singing when we say that language? We're saying, Lord, manifest yourself in our lives. Even one of the songs we sing, you said that you would pour your spirit out. Guess what? He did that in Acts chapter 2. But there's nothing wrong with us singing, Lord, fresh and new. Let, what are we saying? Let there be a refreshing happen in my life, right? Manifest yourself. Why am I using the word manifest? Because we already have the Holy Spirit. So we already have peace when we have Christ, when we are what we call in Christ. Some other terminology that you've probably heard over the years in church would be getting saved, committing your life to Christ, becoming a disciple, being converted. Those are the language that we, what do we mean? We mean that I have put my faith and hope in the sacrifice of Christ. I have traded my rightness before God. A big word for that is righteousness before God for Christ's righteousness. So now God, the now Christ's righteousness has been imputed to me. It's been given to me, right? So we have the peace of God because Christ has given us peace. So last week, the title of the message was peace up, down, and sideways, right? All over the place. Why is it all over the place? Because Jesus dwells on the inside of me. So in this same line of thought, we won't go back through that message. You can watch it online. Paul comes right after that, and he says, for through him we both both have access in one spirit to the Father. So here's the premise of the message today, okay? Here is the key thought, if you will, if you want to take a key thought away. I'm kind of a big picture guy. I like things that are simple and things I can grab in one statement. Here's the key thought for today. We must have the proper perspective of the Father if we're going to have the proper perspective as a father. 
We can't be fully a natural father in the way that God intends unless we have a proper view of the father, right? Now, let me take that a step further. I'm going to submit to you that as a believer, because I realize I'm talking to people in the room today that are not dads. So please don't disqualify yourself because I would say to you, it's impossible for us to have a proper view of who we are in Christ as a believer without the proper view of the Father. I say it like this a lot. And the reason that I say this over and over again is because I realize nobody hears you the first time. I mean, you hear marketers say, you got to say things I've heard eight times, I've heard 14 times, you know, I've heard all. The fact of the matter is, nobody hears you the first time. So I've been freed from the fear of repetition. And I'll say this to myself at times because I think it is so vital in the life of believers because we have a lot of people who are believers that you intellectually and mentally know this but you do not live it experientially. In other words, you know that God loves you. You know that God accepts you because you've heard the Bible story. You've heard all those things, but you don't live that way experientially because you know something in your head that has not made it into your spirit and in your heart and into your being. That make sense? So here's how I, I say this statement oftentimes because it's a statement that I feel like clicked for me when I finally got this. It's the difference in operating from a place of sonship and operating for a place of sonship. It's the difference in operating from a place of sonship rather than for. What do I mean by that? What I mean is I know that through Christ, I am accepted as a son of God fully. Now, from that place... I begin to labor in the kingdom. I begin to grow in Christ. I begin to walk out spiritual disciplines in my life. I begin to do, I begin to tell people about Jesus. I begin to do all that from a place of sonship. Here's the problem we run into because for many years of my Christian life, I did not do those things from a place of sonship. I did at a subconscious level, I did those things for a place of sonship. What I mean is we somehow, you find believers all over the place working for God, believing subconsciously, most of the time not consciously, but believing God subconsciously that the more I do for God, the more uh, I have his approval or the more he's proud of me. I got to tell you, church, that's not Bible. Now, let's, I want to make sure I'm very clear here. Do we work in the kingdom? Yes. Should we grow in our relationship with God? Absolutely. Yes. But again, that comes from a place of sonship. I'm accepted by God through my faith in Jesus, not because I witnessed the 50 people yesterday. Now, is it good for me to witness the 50 people? By all means, let's tell people about Jesus. But when we go to bed at night and we lay our head down, if we feel bad or less accepted by God for what happened that day, or let me say this, more accepted by God for what happened that day, that's not the gospel. Jonathan, why are you harping on this? Because it is so key to our relationship with God. It's massive, massive. If we don't get this one thing deep in the realm of our being, we will spend our life chasing after something that eludes us. Chasing after approval and acceptance by God. I got to tell you, church, the gospel is I can't do anything in my own strength or in my own power or in my own intellect or in my own righteousness to be accepted by God. Zero. Nothing. Think of the person that you admire the most, that you think is the greatest human being that's ever lived, that is the nicest, kindest, most gracious person you've ever thought of. You've never heard a cross word out of their mouth. They are the greatest person you could imagine. You know, the chasm between them and God when it comes to righteousness is so large, no one can fill it. It's massive. The greatest person you know. Now, normally when we think of the greatest person that we know, 
We think of ourselves, we put them here and then we put ourselves here, don't we? We do that, why? Because they're the greatest person we know. And yet that chasm is still so huge. It has to be filled by Christ and his righteousness. So I'm accepted by God because of Christ, not because of what I do. Now, out of that acceptance, I do stuff. So I'm not talking about laziness. I'm not talking about just kind of hanging out all, you know, just messing around. Because there's labor to be done in the kingdom. There's intentionality when it comes to growing in my relationship with Christ. So you kind of come up subconsciously believing that I'm reading my Bible every day. I, mean, I remember youth camps. I remember as a youth pastor. I remember preaching this. Lord, help me. In essence, you never explicitly say this, but almost implicitly saying, if you read your Bible more, God will love you more. You pray more, God's going to love you more. God is going to prove it you more. He's going to love you more. That's terrible. I grieve when I think that I even insinuated that. Now, as a believer, is it good to read the Bible? Yes. Are we going to grow more in our relationship with Christ as we read the Word? Absolutely. Are people around us going to see the change in our life? Or is there going to be growth through doing some of those things and through disciplines? Absolutely. So I'm not saying we don't do that. I'm just saying we do it from a place rather than for a place. It's big, church. If we don't get this, it's hard for us to get anything else. It's big. Massive. It's the difference between living from a position or place of sonship rather than for. See, I recognize that as I stand here before you in a room this size, crowd this size, I'm positive there's people in this room that you grew up and you had, let's just call it what it was, a terrible father in the natural. Terrible. And sometimes I think this is one reason why Uh, you know, when you hear people talk about, sometimes we'll phrase it like this, someone who's got a father wound. In other words, you were hurt so deeply by your dad, sometimes intentional, maybe oftentimes not intentional, but so wounded by that, that it's really uh, harmed you in life. It's harmed just about every area of your life. Now, how many of you know when you get delivered from something, no matter what it is, it's really easy to identify that in other people, isn't it? You just see it. I'm not talking about running around judging folks. I'm just saying when God brings healing, then you just begin to see it so clearly. And so I know that I'm talking to some folks here today that you just did not have a good experience with the Father in the natural. And so that may have even affected how you see God as Father. In fact, some people go so far as they just say, well, we're just going to take Father out of the Bible, we're going to put mother there. Well, guess what? There's people that have bad experience with their mom too. And guess what? When we put language to God, God's not male or female. God's a spirit. So I like how Glenn says, it's funny. He said, listen, if you got a problem calling God father, just, you know, well, I'm not going to credit this to Glenn because I'm going to change it and make it Jonathan in case it hurts anybody's feelings. But basically, I... If you're a lady and you have a trouble or a guy calling God father, I mean, it's no different than me being the bride of Christ. I'm not a bride. But that's what we are. We're the bride of Christ. Galen, how did I get off on that? I don't know. I just. Yeah, happy Father's Day. There we go. So here's my hope, right? Here's my hope for you today. Just in these next few minutes that we have together, that that no matter what your natural father was. And, you know, honestly, maybe you're here this morning, you're living with some guilt and shame and condemnation out of your own fatherhood. Maybe you've just blown it. And I love this quote. They use it for so many things, but basically, you know, I've heard it about investing. I've heard it about planting trees. I've heard about everything. When was the best time to invest? 20 years ago or today? Well, you can't do it 20 years ago, so let's just start today. When was the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago or today? Can't do it 20 years. Let's start today. So maybe you're here and you're walking through, you know, maybe you're walking through just, boy, I've really blown it. I've messed up. Guess what? You can't change the last 20 years. But today you can begin to turn around and walk those things out and just see what God does in it. It's amazing. So here's the main thought. Here's the main thought I want to get to us today. He, that's Jesus, has given us access to 
the Father. This word access, when you look at that, the original language, it means it's not just like, oh yeah, you can do it. It's, it's like access to a king or someone of importance, right? It's like me granting access to someone that's important. So, for example, if we were going to go today and we were going to meet the Queen of England, Right? There would be protocols for us to meet the Queen of England. They would tell us what to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say. And how many of you know we're not going to walk up in Buckingham Palace with shorts and T-shirts and flip-flops. Like we're going we're to dress up. We're going to be looking good. We're going to be ready. And we're going to go meet the Queen because she's royalty. And probably you're not going to meet the Queen unless you knew someone who knew the Queen or gave you access to the Queen. I think about uh, this quote often. I believe this is a, a, a principle, but I, uh, I made a vow out of it as a kid. And, and here's the, the, the saying that we say, it's not what you know, it's who you know, right? And every time I say that, I think about, not every time, but oftentimes I think about when I was 14 years old playing Pony League baseball. And I had this situation happen and, uh, and I made a vow out of it. Basically, I was the catcher on my team, right? I was the starting catcher on my baseball team in Pony League. And when it came time to pick the All-Stars, the guy who was the backup catcher on my team made the All-Star team as the catcher over me. So I'm thinking, wait a second, this guy is not good enough to be the starter on one team, yet he got picked to be the catcher for the all-star team. And so I made a vow out of it. Oh, I forgot to mention to you that his dad was the head of the booster club. So what vow did Jonathan make out of that situation? Well, it's not what you know, it's who you know. For many years, I lived with that vow. Even though I believe that principle is true, I had made a vow out of it. We don't have time to talk about vows, but my goodness, that's a big one. I can remember talking to my dad. You know, as parents, like you don't get it as a kid, but as a parent, your kid comes to you and they're like, you know, like saying stuff to you and kind of, you know, arguing their point, so to speak. And inside you're saying, well, they kind of have a point, but like, I can't totally agree. Like I need to like help them walk through this. Anybody ever been there, right? And I can remember talking to my dad and you know, my dad, I... Bless him. At some point, he just had to say, you know what, son, you're right. It just wasn't fair. I mean, it's just not right. It's not just, but I don't remember all the words he says, but at the end of the day, it was like, it's life. You know what I'm saying? Like it happens at times, you know? Now I've got one of my daughters is just like that. She is really concerned about injustice. She's like her dad. And so I've had to just say, well, babe, it is what it is. I mean, you know what I'm saying? There's some times where it is what it is. And, and that's what it is. But how many of you know that oftentimes in life, it isn't what you know, it is who you know. And here's the beautiful thing for us, a believer. Guess who we know? Because the Bible says right here that he, Christ, has given us access to God by his spirit. So here's the deal. The spirit of God, if I could sum it up, I'd say it like this. The spirit invites us. Jesus dresses us and the Father welcomes us, right? The Bible says that no one comes to the Father except the Holy Spirit draws him. So the Holy Spirit has drawn us. He has given us the invitation. We are going to see the King, baby. But I can't go see the King like this. So now Jesus comes and he dresses me with his righteousness. And the Father is saying, I want my sons and daughters to come home. And so I can walk up in there with the, with the robe, if you will, or the dress of Jesus. The Holy Spirit invites us. Jesus dresses us. And the Father welcomes us. My goodness. You're invited today. How? It's in one spirit. Let me go through a couple of scriptures here and read these to you. The ability to receive and enjoy the presence of God. We were talking about this before, 1 Corinthians 3.16. It says, do you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? Right? That's how we know that we belong to Christ is that the Spirit of God lives in us. The Hebrew word, one of the names of God, Jehovah Sitkanu, the Lord our righteousness. Listen to a couple passages right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 21. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. The Holy Spirit 
has invited us. Christ has dressed us and the Father has welcomed us. 1 Peter 3.18, Christ suffered for our sins for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. 1 John 1, 9, we confess our sins to him. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. Some translations say from all unrighteousness. God sanctifies us. 1 Corinthians 6, 11, it says, some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God. How? By calling on the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of God. What am I, what am I saying? I'm saying that through the Holy Spirit and through the sacrifice of Christ, we have access to the Father. Now what happens? So out of that, now the Bible tells me in Hebrews that I can approach the throne with confidence and boldness. Let me read this to you in Hebrews 10. And so, dear brothers and sisters, uh, this is verse 19 and 20. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. What's that talking about? Well, if you've been around our series for a bit, Paul talks about a little bit earlier in chapter 2 about the middle wall of partition being broken down. He's talking about the Jewish temple, physical temple located in Jerusalem, and that temple had different courts. So Gentiles or non-Jews could come into the outer court. Everybody was welcome there. But then there were stones that lined all the way around with an inscription that said, if you come past this thing, you are responsible for your own life because the penalty for a non-Jew to step into that, uh, past that wall of partition was death. And then there was another court that ladies could go in and then the guys could go a little bit further and then the regular priests could go a little bit further. But only the high priest once a year could go into the most holy place and offer sacrifice for the sins of all the people. And by the way, he was wearing a robe with bells on with a rope around him so that if he had sin and God struck him dead, they could just yank him back out. So if the bell stopped jingling, then he was dead. Y'all just pull him on out. Who would want that job? My goodness. And Paul is saying, even though we mentioned last week, physically that wall is still there. Paul's writing this letter and that wall is still physically there. The temple has not been destroyed yet. But he's already saying spiritually that wall is invisible. Now this is another story, but it's interesting that Paul still in the natural obeyed that. In fact, that's why he's in prison writing this epistle because they thought he had taken Gentiles into the, into the inner court where they weren't supposed to go. So that's what he's talking about, the curtain. The curtain has been torn in two. That thick curtain into the most holy place has been torn in two. Now in that day, what they did, history tells us, the Bible didn't say this, but history says that they sewed that curtain back up and continued business as usual. My, there's a lot of good sermons in that right there. When there's a move of God and we just say, ah, we're just going to do our thing. So Jesus... The disciples in Luke 11, let me kind of finish by saying this. The disciples in, in Luke 11 come to Jesus and they say to him, teach us how to pray. One of the disciples comes and says, teach us how to pray. So Jesus goes into what we know as the Lord's Prayer. The one that we quote oftentimes comes out of Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13, right around that area. And Jesus is in the midst. By the way, it's hilarious. Every time I think of the Lord's Prayer, I think about my high school baseball coach because the way that I learned the Lord's Prayer was on my high school baseball team because my baseball coach, God bless him, I don't know that he loved Jesus at all, but he would constantly, he'd get us in the little huddle like we do. Maybe this is why we do this with the leader rally. I don't know, but we'd all have our hands in the huddle. Inevitably, there'd be some guys out there not listening. And so he would have his hands in the huddle. We'd all be ready to say the Lord's Prayer. And Coach Al be saying, hey, you bleep, 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 please get over here. Our Father, which art in heaven. I mean, and it just struck me at how opposite those two things were, you know. And that's how I learned the Lord's Prayer and committed it to memory was in that circle. It's amazing how God uses every, everyone and everything, right? But isn't it interesting? So it's hard for me to think about the Lord's Prayer and not think about Coach Al. Bless him. Isn't it interesting, though, Jesus is talking about, uh, this is a, a little bit of a side note, but there in Matthew chapter 6, he's talking about hypocrisy. The context of the verse is hypocrisy. First, he talks about giving. 
Bob alluded to this in the, in, when he was talking about the message that he's saying, don't flaunt what you're giving in front of everybody. And then he goes into prayer and said, don't be out there like the hypocrites showing everybody how religious they are um, praying. You know, by the way, this is not an admonition to never pray in public. I've heard that before and I'm saying, stop it. Stop it. But Jesus says to him, go and find the closet and pray. And this is how you pray. Our Father art in heaven. Again, he's also not given us a formula. Now, I thank the Lord that he heard our prayer in the baseball huddle. And I'm thankful that that scripture got into me, you know, memorized. But we were just saying a chant, just chanting mindless words is not what we're taught. Jesus isn't saying, here's how you have to pray every single time, even though the Lord's prayer is very beautiful. But he's not giving you some formula to say, pray exactly like this. He's given us principles and he's saying, here is how to pray. And it is, isn't it interesting? Some of that's a whole other message, but isn't it interesting that when the disciples came to Jesus and said, how do we do this? Jesus, the son of God, fully God, fully man, he starts off by saying, this is how you do it. Our father. Isn't it interesting that Jesus addresses God as a father. How I many of God is a lot of things even beyond a father? And isn't it interesting that Jesus chose when he's teaching us to pray, he addresses God as father. I think that's a powerful truth. I think it's powerful to think about that the son of God would do that. And he says, hallowed be your name. Hallowed, consecrated for sacred youth, for use. Treated as sacred, reverenced. You're my father and I reverence you. It's amazing. We think about that and we think about adoption. I love this verse in Romans 8, 15. It says, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, God. I love adoption. When I think of adoption, it's amazing because when you, when you think of your own life, you know, think of your own life. If you were born into uh, a family, maybe traditional nuclear family, born into that, you probably cannot point back to the time when you realized that your dad was your dad. You probably can't point back to that moment. Like in developmentally, your dad being your dad. Probably the only way that anyone could do that is if they were adopted later in life when you're conscious of that and now that person has maybe become officially your dad through a court system of adoption but now has grown over the years into a true father and care. And I love the idea of adoption. I think it's so powerful. The reason I think it's so powerful is number one, it's biblical language, but, but also the fact that it's purposeful and intentional. It's not nonchalant. Adoption is not nonchalant. It's hard for me to talk about adoption without thinking about uh, my nephew. My sister adopted him. He's 14, 15 now, just an awesome young man. Adopted him when he's very young, and he came home one day when he's five or six years old, and the kids are giving him a hard time at school and making fun of him because he was adopted. And my sister, I'm telling you, my sister's really a, an awesome lady, but this had to be the Holy Spirit to give her these words. I thought it was so awesome. She said, you know, honey, there's not one kid at that school that chose their parents. And there's no parents at that school that chose any of their kids. It's kind of that, you know, as you tell your kids, you get what you get and you don't get upset, or you get what you get and you don't throw a fit, right? <laughs> it just is what it is, you know? But she said, we didn't do that. We chose you. We said, we want him. That's the one we want. Oh, man, that's powerful. It wasn't just some nonchalant thing that you're in Christ. God said, I want that one right there. Holy Spirit, invite that one. Jesus said, I'll address that one. The Father said, I welcome that one. Man, it's powerful. Powerful. Purposeful. Intentional. Jonathan, why are you saying that? Because let me just share a couple thoughts with you. That was my introduction. Glory to God. If you come here all the time, you know I joke a lot. It's powerful. Before I share literally these 
last couple of thoughts that take about five minutes. I want to I want to show a, a quick video. If, let me introduce it. Baseball's been played in the United States since 1875. All right, this is 1990, I believe it is. 1990, yeah, 1990. Uh, and something happened in 1990, September 1990, that had never happened before. Um, and I don't think that it's ever happened since. And that was Ken Griffey Sr. had been uh, brought over to the Mariners. And Ken Griffey Jr. had just been drafted to the Mariners. And so now you've got a father and son playing on the same team. So check this out right here. Watch this video. It's really cool. We'll see what happened in this game. September 14, 1990. Ken Griffey Jr. Devon comes up to the plate. Gone, a two-run home run. Left center field, and he can still home run. <laughs> the next batter An instantaneous two to is his to son, Ken Griffey Jr. This is the next at bat. Guess what he does? Home he run. Well Almost the exact same back. spot. Back to back so 115 run. years, <laughs> this had never happened. A what father and son hit. Back-to-back -back home runs. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Now, I don't know that there's any spiritual significance of that. I just think it's really cool. <laughs> but we do, we do imitate our fathers. I do think it's a beautiful picture of that. And maybe you're here today, and this is a couple of things I want to share with you today. Maybe you're here today, and, and you're, you're a dad yourself. And I, I want to say to you that and you've experienced this probably, we oftentimes, our first experience of God, our Father, of the Father, comes through our experience with our natural Father. That's why I think sometimes the blessing of a dad is so powerful, and, and the, the wound of a dad is powerful. I was at a conference this week. I didn't tell this in the first service, but I was at a conference this week, and uh, there was a guy there uh, Dr. Dale Bronner, he pastors a really large church in Atlanta, and they have the, the largest hair care company for African Americans uh, in the country. I mean, it's a massive business started by his dad. I believe the name of the product is Bronner Brothers Hair Care, something like that. There's six of them. He's one of six. He was the fourth. This guy was so distinguished. I'm I don't know if I've ever met a more distinguished guy. It's just one of those guys that's like, you know what I'm saying? You, they, it's like an aura about him. You know what I mean? This guy was so distinguished. And we were standing there listening to him, and they were interviewing him. He shared, and then they interviewed him. And the interviewer asked him, what was, you know, what did your dad do? Like, how did this happen? How did you, you know, how did you, how did it kind of come to the boys? And da, 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 da. And he said, one day, my dad brought us all in. There were six of us. He brought us in at the business. Everyone was watching, and we all walked in and knelt down before him. And he went down and laid his hands on each one of us. He began to pray and prophesy over us. And I'm doing today, he's probably in his late 50s, early 60s. He said, I'm doing today, 50 years later, what my dad prophesied to me that day. And I was in the audience and I leaned over the person beside me. I said, man, I just felt that. I mean, the way he said it was just the power of the blessing of a dad. Some of you in this room, you've given that. Some of you in this room, you've received that. And some of you in this room, it's been nothing like that for you. So I want to say to us as dads today, because our first impression, the first impression of our kids oftentimes is a heavenly father comes through us, let's be good dads. Say, well, Jonathan, I've blown it. Well, you had 20 years ago and today. Let's start today. Now, lest you beat yourself up, let me give you this second thought. Let's recognize that we all fail and that we can never be our kids' heavenly father. Lene said something, uh, Lene, Jeff and Lene are part of our pastoral team, and Lene shared on Mother's Day, and she said something that just struck me. It was so good. She said something along the lines of, it really doesn't matter, you know, whether you're a great mother or a terrible mother, or you had a great mother or had a terrible mother, it's not good mothers and good fathers or bad mothers and bad fathers that save their kids. Only Jesus can do that. So whether you're here today and you've totally blown it, or you're here today and your dad totally blew it, let me say to you today, it's none of that, all of that pales in comparison. I'm not saying it's not in 
important or significant. So I'm not trying to minimize anyone's pain. I'm just saying to you, it's insignificant in comparison to the love of the Father when we grab hold of that. So we're going to blow it, guys. There's been times that I've been a great dad. And there's been times I've been a terrible dad. And there's going to be times in the future I'm going to be a great dad. And there's going to be times in the future I'm going to be a terrible dad. Because we're going to blow it. Thank the Lord it's not dependent on me. But it's Christ living in me. As men, oftentimes we feel the weight of responsibility for our families, and we should. We should feel that weight in a healthy way to provide and care for, but we cannot bear that burden alone. We have to trust Christ for strength, provision, direction, everything. And every dad said, yes, and amen. I remember getting married and thinking, man, I'm about to get, like, I got another person I'm responsible for. And then I remember having kids. Oh, man. You dads, you can remember. You remember the weight of that. Because if I had to live under a bridge and eat peanut butter and jelly every day, I mean, it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? But, like, now I got a kid. My kid can't be doing this. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, that's just real talk, as they say. So we do have a responsibility, but we got to trust guys. We got to trust God in it, guys. And let me say for you as a believer, every believer, we got to trust God in it. Thirdly, let me say this, we'll be done. Even if we didn't have a good example of a father, we're not disqualified and we have access to the father. Your earthly father could have been horrendous. I'm going to tell you, there's a father who's only good that cares for you. If you'll allow him He'll bring healing to every aspect of your soul. If you've had a terrible father, if you are a father and you want to be a better father, I'm telling you, God, the Father, desires to bring healing, to help you walk that out, to work in your life, to care for you. See, here's the amazing thing. Let me finish with this thought here. I've said that a couple times. I know this is for real. Think about the context of what, who Paul's writing to. Okay, Paul's writing to the Ephesians. He's a Jew himself. He's just talking about, the idea that he's trying to portray is that there's no separation between Jews and Gentiles, right? Because the Gentiles had been on the outside. The Jews had lived outwardly. They were God's people outwardly, right? And so the nation of Israel, and they're walking through all this. And Paul is saying, the mystery of God is that, man, these Gentiles... They've been in here. And, and, you know, you see Christ throughout the Old Testament too. That's another message. We'll get into that. But Paul is saying that they're one in Christ. And he's talking. He's saying this group that we've perceived to be religious and this group that we've perceived to be pagans, now they've been made one new man in Christ. Now think about how revolutionary that would have been in the thought of a Jew at that time. Because the way that the Jew at that time gained acceptance by God was through, their, through what they were doing. It was an action. Their acceptance by God was tied to an action. And Paul is saying, no, no, our acceptance to God is not tied to an action or to actions, I should say. It's tied to a person, Jesus So the real point is that he's saying where in the past the Jews that had access to the Father had been in action, now it's a person, it's Jesus. So he's saying you have by the Spirit, by Christ, he has given us access, VIP access. The Spirit has invited us, Jesus has dressed us, and the Father has welcomed us. I want to say to you today, whether you're a dad or you're a believer, As we started this, it's foundational for us to operate from a place rather than for a place. I'm going to invite you for just a moment to bow your heads with me. Would you you close your eyes for just a moment where you are? Maybe you're here and you say, Jonathan, I've never accepted Christ in my life. I've never asked him to come in. I've, 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 I've never put my hope and trust in him. That's you. I want to give you an opportunity. The way even that we, that we respond to this is, you know what? The Holy Spirit's inviting you. Jesus waiting for the clothes to dress you. So the Father has said, I want that one. That's 
that's you this morning, would you just raise your hand? I want to pray over you. I'm not going to invite you to the front. I'm not going to do anything embarrassing. I just want to recognize you. I want to pray over you this morning. Oftentimes we think we're in a place because somebody invited us and really God's just got a plan. He's been drawing you. That's all part of the Holy Spirit's invitation. Anybody in here? I just want to pray over you this morning. Father, I thank you. Thank you for the men and women in this room. Lord, I'm grateful on this Father's Day that we serve ultimately a good Father. You're only good, Lord. We bless you today. And I pray over the fathers in this room. I pray that you would help all of us, enable all of us by your Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of us, Lord, to grow into the fathers that you desire for us to be. For everyone that's been wounded by a father or everyone, Lord, maybe has struggled as a dad, I thank you for empowering us. I thank you for bringing healing and hope. Touch hearts today, Lord. Minister wholeness today. Send brothers and sisters around us to help us walk out the process of healing to see everything restored in our life. We thank you for it. We bless you for it. In Jesus' name, if you believe that, can you say a good amen?